So let's summarize what we've learned. So we've discussed these various operators. So we have this logarithmic operator, which is this integral. like this um, for functions. So we're going to do everything for functions of compact support, C infinity to C infinity, like this. And we have the Cauchy transform. Uh, so this should be 2 over pi right here. The Cauchy transform is this guy. Uh, so like this. And we have f of zeta over uh, zeta minus z v uh, zeta like this, right? Um, and these are nice linear transformations from the space of functions to the space of functions. And we learned some nice relationships or some nice identities. So the first thing we learned is that if we take the Cauchy transform and we take the anti-conformal part of the gradient, um, then, then uh, this thing just gives the function back itself. That's the first calculation we learned. So this is identity one. We also learned that, that these guys behave nicely with respect to translation and that allowed us to take the derivative through. Right? So if we take either the conformal part of the gradient of this guy, or the anticonformal, we can just go directly through like this. Okay. Um, and what else did we learn? We learned that if we take, so let's call that identity this, let's call that 2. And we also learned that if we take the just the conformal part of the gradient like this of the logarithmic transport, then by this first property that's the same as like this. And that allowed us to put the gradient actually on the log and that gave us exactly the Cauchy transform of the function itself, right? Those are the three identities that we learned, you know? And these guys are just exercises in differentiation. Uh, all these things, the kernel is integral when we have an L infinity function, so the singularity here is integral, same for the log. So we can just define this like this, it's the full integral, everything is, everything is cool, right? That's what we got to. So, um, my, what the, our goal is to show that, that this relation is a commutative relation in the sense that if we uh, first take the anticonformal part of the gradient, then do the, the Cauchy transform, then we're going to get back to the Id identity for these functions of compact support. And we're going to use these identities to do that. So, claim that if we do this Cauchy transform composed with the anticonform of the gradient is the same as doing the anticonform of the gradient composed with the Cauchy transform, which will give us the identity for any f which is compactly supported C infinity in the complex numbers. That's our claim. And we already have this part of the claim, that's what this thing says. Yeah, that's identity one. And now we're going to do the second part of the claim. Okay, so it's going to follow from the following thing. So from this identity here, so from three, if we do the following, if we take the conformal part of the gradient times uh, so this is the part left we want to establish right here. This is the guy we need. So if we do that, so let's take the full anti-conform part of the gradient times the 
Cauchy transform acting on F. Now the Cauchy transform acting on F is the same as the partial with respect to Z of L of F. So that's the same as D by DZ bar, D by DZ, L of F, like this, yeah? By this identity three. Now F is a C infinity mapping. The, the logarithmic transform will also be a C infinity mapping, which is not hard to see. So that means that we can swap the order of differentiation, right? Differentiation for Soros commutative when we're differentiating smooth functions. So that is the same as, as swapping the order like this. Yeah. And from this property, we know that, that we can differentiate through the logarithmic operator because again it's it works well with translations because of this particular structure so then this thing is the same as d by dz of uh, uh, i have to be a bit careful Yeah, you want to differentiate through this thing, L like this, df by dz bar, like this. But we also know that when we take the derivative of the logarithmic transform, it's the same as, 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 the, as the logarithmic transform acting on the derivative, which turns out to be the Cauchy transform. That was the final calculation of the previous class, right? So, so this is a bracket just to emphasize. So then this thing is the derivative of the logarithmic transform applied to this function, so that's the same as the Cauchy transform applied to this, like this. And now we have the identity again that this gives, this gives the identity, right? So this thing is the identity like this. So that's the second part. So now that says we can, when we take the anticonform part of the gradient, apply to the Cauchy transform of a smooth function, we get back to the identity, just using our three identities over there. Are you all with me here? Yeah? Okay, cool. So, this establishes the claim. So here's my question for you guys. Does this mean that uh, the Cauchy transform and the inverse part of the gradient are, in, are, invert, are, are inverses of each other. Does this mean that we've just shown that the Cauchy transform and the adding form of the gradient are inverses? The answer is no, because the adding form of the gradient is, has a non-trivial kernel. Right? So recall, If f is holomorphic, I mean, it's very natural to think yes, because that's what this identity seems to say, uh, but uh, hollow is good enough. But actually, there's, there's a subtly going, called if f is holomorphic, then when we do this, d by dz bar of f, then this is exactly it's exactly Cauchy Riemann equations, and then this thing is just equal to zero. Yeah? So this d by dz bar operator has a non-trivial kernel. And if we think about this even more, how did we first get to this? Well, we broke down the gradient when we thought of it as a two by two matrix into a conformal and anti-conformal part. Yeah? So this d by dz operator, it's taking the gradient and then it's projecting the gradient onto the anti-conformal parts. Yeah, so it's it's a projection onto a two-dimensional subspace of a four-dimensional space. So it's definitely got a non-trivial kernel. Yeah, so it can't be an invertible mapping. Yeah. So why is this? Why do we look, seem to have something like this? Why does it seem to be? Why? I mean, this is saying that on this particular class of compactly supported C-infinity functions, we are able to invert. Why so? What's underlying this? So here we have a non-trivial kernel just by this, right? And here we have invertibility on a certain subspace, right? Or oh, is this a subspace? It's not a subspace. On a certain, on a certain set. 
And the reason these things are mutually compatible is that the kernel here doesn't intersect this space, right? Because we don't have any holomorphic functions that are C infinity of compact support. Yeah? Because if we have a C infinity function on the entire complex plane of compact support, it's going to be a bounded function. Yeah? And therefore it's going to be constant, but if it's got compact support, then it's actually just zero. Yeah? So this thing is just on some subset that avoids the kernel of this operator and allows us to write this statement. Yeah? So let's call this thing. So non-trivial kernel, like a very non-trivial kernel. Not invertible operator. But there are hollow functions. on this. So the claim is not contradicted. So another example kind of related is to do this. If we define this operator L of G of, uh, L is a bad choice, because already used, let's say P of G of X to be the integral from minus infinity to X of G of T dt for G which are compactly supported C infinity on the entire real line, right? Then D by dx of P will just be the identity, you yeah? that, know? That'll be true just a fundamental theorem of calculus, right? And you might be tempted to, uh, and it's also the, also have the universe that, and P of, uh, let me write like this, D by dx composed with P, and P composed by D by dt, or D by dx, is also gonna be the identity, yeah? but only on this space of functions. Yeah, because that's absolutely not true in general, because if we differentiate constant functions, we have a non-trivial kernel, yeah? So it's, there are, it's not hard to come up with examples of, of, of phenomena for which this is true, where we have some subspace where operators seem to be invertible, but in general, there is a non-trivial kernel of one of them, and we don't have general inverses. Yeah. Cool. All right. So we have this useful identity. Yeah, this is going to help us a lot. One of the coolest things about, about the logarithmic transform was that we could pass the derivatives through them. Yeah. I claim that this identity means we're now going to pass the derivatives through the Cauchy transform. So while I erase the board, Try and try and come up with how that works. Okay, so claim that if we take the d by dz, then it's c of df by dz, and if we take the d, then it is c of df by dz bar. Why, why does this follow from what we've just learned? What do we know? We know that when we take d by dz of the Laurel transform of f, then this does turn into the Cauchy transform because we put the gradient on the kernel like this. So then, um, if we do d by dz of the Cauchy transform like this, then uh, we can pass the gradients inside via this step here, right? So this thing is also the same as L of df by dz, yeah? 
So then we have d by dz of L of df by dz. We can pass the gradient inside again like this. Now I think that's all we need to do because this is this general identity now just applied to L itself. So just, just looking at this thing, this thing by a general identity is this thing. So that is just the Cauchy transform applied to d by df like this. Okay. Yeah, so this is the Cauchy transform of f, which is the same as L applied to the conformal part of the gradient in the brackets like this. And when we differentiate it again, then we get this identity again. Yeah. And if we do this, if we do d by dz bar of f this, then same thing, we're going to think about this as doing d by dz bar of d by dz of uh, L of f, like this. And then since this is smooth, we can swap the order of differentiation. So it's d by dz, d by dz bar of L of f. For, f it, for L itself, the derivatives pass through. So that's d by dz bar of L of df by dz. And then d by dz of L is the conformal thing, so. Okay. So this, this thing that we proved last time means that just by the fact that we can do the swapping of the order outside when we, outside of, outside when we're just acting on a smooth function, means that we can pass the derivatives through. Yeah. So we're passing the derivatives through. Cool. Okay, so it's the proof of the claim. Maybe I don't need this. Put a line under it. Okay. Now we're going to define the Berling transform, which is the guy we've been building up to. So, Berling transform. All of these relationships have been for functions that are of compact support in C infinity. So F belongs to compact support, C infinity, complex numbers. This into the complex numbers. And the building transform will also going to define it for such functions and s of f and let me get the constant right i think it's one over pi or minus one over pi that's minus one over pi the limit as epsilon tends to zero so let's write the variable inside and then the limit as epsilon tends to zero of the double integral of the complex plane Take away this thing of f of zeta d zeta, like this. This is the Berling transform. Um, first thing to note, this thing a priori doesn't make any sense. Uh, this kernel is not integrable. If we try and integrate this, it just blows up, right? So. Um, so even if we have a C infinity function, f, so it's nicely bounded around everywhere, right? This thing is blowing up. Uh, so the only way that this would make sense would and that give us a finite number would be if there's internal cancellations, right? So notice this, that if we do the integral around the ball of radius epsilon of z, of one over, zeta minus z 
Z minus zeta. Zeta, and let's take the absolute value signs around it. So we're just doing the, the calculation in terms of magnitude, and so not allowing for any cancellation. So you get the absolute value like this. Then that is just the same. Let's do the double integral to make sure we emphasize doing this entire complex plane. Then that's the same as integrating double integral all of radius epsilon around z. And this is the same as, let's do this as x plus i y minus uh, z uh, let's actually call it z zero because we typically like this squared dx by dy yeah there's no we can change variables to make z zero just be equal to zero so then that's the same as the double integral around ball of radius zero and then just this thing, uh, x squared plus y squared square rooted, yeah? And then let's use the Carrier formula. Let's integrate this from zero to epsilon, and then integrate this around the bound with the balls of radius s around zero. So then this becomes one over s, h, the h1 uh, 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 of, let's say, w, and then the, S, right? This is just breaking down the integral onto these integrals around radii. We've done several times. It's the Carrier formula. And um, uh, oh, it's not this, it's this thing because the thing is squared. So then this is this thing squared. Yeah. And then this thing is the integral from zero to epsilon of two pi over s ds, which is infinity. Yeah. So epiri this thing doesn't give us a finite number unless we know extra stuff about why there will be some cancellation going on here. Yeah? Yeah. So in, in this case, is we really do have to do this limit and we have to justify that this limit exists. These other kernels we've dealt with so far are actually integrable when we deal with bounded functions. So you do this for, for the Cauchy kernel, you do this for the log kernel, they're integrable. Yeah? But now, now this thing is, is strictly needed. No? Cool. And part of showing that this thing is actually making sense is, is the identity, which I'm about to show, um, which, is, which is sometimes how Cauchy, uh, how the Berlin transform is defined. So claim, well, perhaps it's usually defined this way, that if we do this, if we do d by dz of the Cauchy transform of a function f, then that thing will give us exactly, uh, uh, let me be more specific than that. Yeah, that thing will give us this thing, this burning transform for f belonging to compactly supported functions. So we saw the complex numbers. And f time. Not too bad. Okay. That will be our claim. And um, if we can do that, then that will say that, that, that this limit exists. I mean, this thing, when we take the derivative of the Cauchy transform of, of, of f, we can put the derivative onto the f and and then it's just a Cauchy transform of some C infinity function, which is another C infinity function. So point wise, it makes sense everywhere. Yeah? So once we show this, then implicitly implies that this limit exists because for every Z, this thing will be some specific number. Are you with me people? Yeah. So from this, we know we would have that the limit in definition star actually exists. Okay, so that's our task to do this. And to do this, we need to do an integration by parts. We need to use an, uh, the divergence theorem in complex coordinates, but this time a slightly different version of it. So this is the version we need. So. 
<coughs> we've already used this particular version. This was in our proof that when we apply the Cauchy transform to the anti conform order of the gradient, we have the identity. So we have seen this identity that when we do this, we have ID like this over some complex domain, and this is the anti conform order of the gradient. Let's do a double integral. Then this thing is minus i over 2 integral around the boundary of dg dz, where this is understood as completely as the uh, standard complex contour integral, right? And we did this, we, we wrote all of this stuff out and verified it, and this is just true. Uh, it just came down to the divergence theorem. Also, and it's a very similar formula, we have this, that if we do the double integral, and this time we take the conformal part of the gradient, Z, then this thing is I over two, this, but now it's got, we have G dZ bar. And what this dZ bar means is the following, that when we do this, <laughs> so given the parameterization Z from too many Zs, maybe AB, into the boundary of the ball, then this integral dg dz bar is the integral from a to b of g of z of t z prime of t bar dt. Okay, that's all that this thing means. Yeah, so it's not. It's not the standard contour integral, but it's a very similar formula. Um, and you can verify yourself that this is, this is a well-defined thing, just in exactly the same way the contour integral is a well-defined thing. And by exactly the same arguments of just writing this thing out point-wise in the real and imaginary parts, and then seeing how the real and imaginary parts exactly give you back the divergence theorem for the real and imaginary parts, you can verify that this is true, just like we verified this is true. Yeah, it'll take a couple of minutes. I check this. This is a true formula, so I'm just going to leave that to you, yeah? because it's exactly the same calculation we did already to verify this. Yeah? So, accepting this formula, that when we integrate around the conform part of the gradient, we can we can find this as i over two integrating around the boundary with respect to this d d z bar. Um, then we are going to establish this identity over here. That is our goal. Theorem d by dz bar, oh sorry, d by dz of the Cauchy transform. Let me just write it this way. d by dz of the Cauchy transform is equal to the Berling transform on compactly supported functions. Um, well, smooth functions from C infinity to C infinity. Okay, and proof. Let's write down the identity again. So, uh, divergence theorem in C, or one of the versions of it is this thing we just wrote down that if we have any double integral over some region with a nice boundary of uh, dw by dz, the conformal part of the gradient, dz. This is i over 2 integral around the boundary of w dz bar. Should be i over 2 is correct. It is. Good. So we'll need to use this because we are going to do integration by parts with this tool. So given Phi, which is compactly supported, C infinity to C infinity. Then pick some, so this is arbitrary W and omega. Put this in a box. So W will have to be continuous up to the boundary and 
and we would need to have at least one derivative, so that'll be one one. Okay, not boundary omega, nice. So that we can parameterize it. So pick some z. Let's give this. Let's call this domain actually pi because oh no, let's leave it as well. So just pick some z inside the complex numbers like this, and then let us let us uh, do the following. Let's take d. Let's take the integral. double integral of the entire complex plane, take the ball of radius epsilon away from z of d by dz uh, of, uh, not d by dz, d by d zeta of phi of zeta zeta minus z, like this. So the reason we're doing this is that we can pass the derivative inside the, uh, inside the Cauchy transform. And once we do that, we'd have an expression like this. Uh, well, okay, okay, one second. We'd have an expression that would be the conformal part of the derivative acting on the Cauchy transform like this, okay? Acting on this kernel like this. So we're going to, we're gonna put the derivative um, onto the kernel via doing this integration by parts trick. So, Let's just accept this formula is worth doing for the time being. We're going to apply our, our, green, our divergence theorem, right? So this is the standard conform part of the gradient on this particular thing, yeah? So we can apply this Green's formula, but the boundary of this thing, since this is compactly supported, the boundary is only going to be the boundary of the, of the ball of radius epsilon around z because the other boundary, there is no other boundary because it's compactly supported. Yeah? So then this is just equal to i over two, the integral around the boundary of the ball of radius epsilon. Uh, it will actually be going in the, anti -clock, in the clockwise way for the reason we talked about before, that inward pointing unit normal looks like this. Right? So, it, this will actually contribute a minus sign if we do the orientation anti-clockwise around the ball. So let's put a minus sign like this. Like this, d by dz, and then of this, this guy here, d rho by d rho minus z, d rho like this. Yeah? Just applying this, this formula above. And we can because this guy is nicely smoothed inside our domain, right? We have it's certainly continuous up to the boundary of the domain. Yeah? Everybody happy. Yeah? And let us give ourselves a parameterization. So let z of t be, uh, I end up choosing z for too many things, t plus e to the i, oops, epsilon plus e to the i t. like this, and then z prime, of course, is just i epsilon e to the i t, like this. So if we do this thing here, then we're going to have the integral from 0 to pi, and then we're going to have phi of z of t. On the bottom here, we're just going to have epsilon e to the i t, like this. And then we're going to take the derivative of this thing, when I mean, we have z prime, but then it's complex conjugate, right? The complex conjugate this thing. So we're going to have uh, i epsilon e to the i t complex conjugate. Yeah? And then what's that? It's complex conjugate of i, which will just be uh, minus i, and then, and then this thing. So this is minus i over 2, integral from 0 pi over 2, and then phi of z of t. We have a minus, like we have this thing will go into minus i, so that will cancel with this minus, and then we'll just have i, and then we'll have e to the, or epsilon, e to the minus i t, like this. 
Bt. Are you all agreeing with me here? Yeah, everybody happy. And then we're going to pass the i through. We'll have a minus 1 over 2. And then this integral, 0 out to 2 pi, phi of z of t dt. Oops, e to minus i dt. But notice the integral from 0 to pi e to the minus i t dt is just equal to 0. This thing is just equal to 0. Oh, oh it got some errors here. Let's check it out. So this is minus, so this is this thing, and it's mi minus 2, right? Minus 2 i t. Yeah? Minus 2 it is that what say, say that again i need epsilon yeah i need epsilon yeah yeah no no i don't need epsilon the epsilon vanishes the epsilon vanishes right yeah the epsilon vanishes right because um because we have an epsilon from here and epsilon from here so they're definitely gone yeah and this becomes e to the minus i t, and this is also e to the minus i t, so it's minus 2, minus 2. Yeah? But happily, this is also true. Yeah, because what is this? This is equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi. The cosine doesn't notice it. And then it's minus i sine of 2 t. And we know what these antiderivatives are, these things are just zero. We know the graphs of these things, the areas cancel out. Yeah? So from this line right here, so from star, then we have that this thing is equal to minus one over two. I mean, the signs don't matter because we're gonna cancel everything. Everything will go to zero ultimately. And then we can just insert this value of phi of z of t minus phi of z. Did I call it z0? I just called it z. All right. Like this. And then e to the minus uh, 2i or minus 2it dt. Yeah? Because this is, this is just a constant for our purpose. Yeah? Z is fixed, we've picked Z. Yeah, so then we can this thing is just this thing is just C of D times this thing. I mean phi of Z times this thing, which is zero. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah? Jaime, are you okay? S speak up, guys. Yeah. So yeah, so this guy here. Let's do a little side note. If we just broke off this integral here, then it's the integral from 0 to 2 pi of phi of z e to the minus 2i t dt. Yeah, this phi of z, we can just pull it out because it doesn't depend on t. z is picked. It's just constant. And then from this line, it's just 0. Yeah, so we can put this inside our expression without any change. Cool. All right, so now we've had this. That means that when we take the absolute value of this thing, then it's going to be equal to the absolute value of this thing. Yeah. Yeah. So absolute value of this initial expression, so absolute value of star, well, not, well I should say, is less than equal to the absolute value when we put the absolute value signs through this thing. Yeah. So it's less than equal to 1 over 2, 0 to 2 pi, the absolute value of phi of z of t minus phi of z, like this, just like this, d by dt. Yeah. But this guy right here is tending to zero, right? Because phi is continuous, z of t is just z plus e to the it, right? So then this thing goes down to zero, 
as epsilon goes down to zero. Yeah. So that means that this entire expression here is going down to zero as epsilon goes down to zero. Yeah. Cool. Okay, I'm out of time. Uh, I wanna, I wanna, uh, I wanna complete the next step. So everybody who needs to leave, which probably is everybody, just leave. And I please watch the next whatever five minutes where I. Uh, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. That um, that it's not the kernel is not integrable. So it uh, it doesn't look like it doesn't look like these things make sense a priori. So, but if you once I show you this this relationship that that the Berling transform of f is the same as the Cauchy transform applied to the conformal part of the gradient of f for a smooth function, the conformal part of the gradient is a, is a smooth function, right? So then the Cauchy transform of a smooth function will also be a smooth function. Just check it out. Yeah? So it will be a pointwise meaningful expression. Yeah? So as part of the proof of what we're doing now will be the fact that, that, that the Berling transform is actually well defined for, for smooth functions. And that's why the Berling transform is often first defined as, as that thing. Yeah? So in the definition I gave, it had, you know, it requires this lemma I'm doing to, to actually make it make sense. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah? Yeah, so we've got the zero is the limit of this thing when we take the conformal part of the gradient like this, oh, conformal part of the gradient. of phi of c uh, of, uh, I like to write it like zeta minus z, like this, d zeta, that's what we learned, right? And we can also just differentiate this thing. So then this thing is the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And we put the derivative on this guy, so we have d phi by dz of zeta, zeta minus z, like this, and then the derivative onto this other guy, phi of zeta, and then we're going to use the chain rule, so we differentiate this guy, we're going to have a minus sign here, and then we're going to have zeta minus z squared, and then differentiating this the internal function would just give us a one, right? Because it's just in front, like this. Yeah? And what is this? Um, this is, this guy right here is just the uh, Cauchy transform of the conformal part of the gradient. And then this guy right here is, is the Berlin transform, right? Um, so this limit as epsilon goes to zero just of this part will exist just by the fact that this kernel is integrable. Yeah? Yeah, so this limit does exist. The, the, the limit of, the, of this sum exists. So, so we could um, subtract the integral of this guy from this entire expression and both the limits exist. So then we can just get end up with this limit. Yeah, so uh, we are not violating limit laws by doing the following thing. We can say that this implies that that the limit as epsilon goes to zero of this thing is indeed equal to this guy, but this guy I don't need to write as a limit because, again, the kernel is integrable. So this is the integral of the entire complex plane, phi by zeta, zeta minus z, z, like this. And this thing is almost the Cauchy transform. It doesn't have the right constant in front. So the right constant would be this uh, minus one over pi. So let's put it in here as well. 
So I can just multiply this by minus one over pi, and this is minus one over pi. And then this thing is exactly the Cauchy transform acting on if I, if I you see the conformal part of the gradient. Yeah. And then this thing is what I define the burning transform to actually be. Okay. So that proves the claim. Just, just this integration by parts. And the fact that the, the, the kernel vanishes when we, when we, uh, so again, that the integral over the, of the boundary of the small ball just vanishes because of this fact that we're doing the anti-conformal, not the anti-conformal, but the z-bar complex line integral around, around the boundary of the ball. Yeah. So this is true for all phi belonging to compact support in the complex numbers, complex numbers. And that gives us good payoff because we know that the, the Cauchy transform behaves well with respect to gradients in the sense that when we take the derivative on the outside, we can pass it through. This identity now says that the same thing will be true for the Berlin transform. So consequently, If we do d by dz of the Berlin transform of some function like this, it's equal to d by dz of this guy is this, which is equal to the Cauchy transform of d by dz of d by, by dz like this. And then this is just this thing. And in the same way, we can pass the anti-conformal part of the gradient through. Oops, d by z bar of the Cauchy transform of the derivative. We've learned that we can pass the derivatives through the Cauchy transform, so. Uh, well, let me do this in one step. So you can pass the derivative through and then internally swap the order of integration because it's a smooth function. So then this is the same as d by dz of d by d phi by dz bar. And then this is the burning transform itself. Yep. So we have these nice identities that we can just differentiate through the burning transform in a, in a straightforward way now that we know that the Berlin transform applied to C infinity functions is just the same as the conformal transform applied to the, sorry, the Cauchy transform applied to the conform part of the gradient of that function. Yeah. Cool. All right, so the Berlin transform is the guy that we're really gonna need to, um, to establish the uh, Beltrami, the solution of the Beltrami equation for arbitrary measurable function, which is L infinity strictly less than one. And, um, and yeah, um, uh, uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to be very very useful to see. And one of the identities we need is right here in front of me, <laughs> but I uh, I'm gonna have to save that for next time. All right, so, so, so yeah. See you all on Wednesday. Have a good day.